Welcome to another Market Radar podcast. We had a massive week uh, with the S&P closing up over 6%, almost 7% for the week. Let's take a look at the year-to-date performances. We got the S&P SPY up down 16.58%, QQQ down 28.31%, IWM down 17.05%. And DIA down 7.63%. The markets are recovering. Everything is still bearish trend, but they are nearing Momo, especially the Dow. The Dow is actually very close to Momo now, and we'll see if we get a break through it. Remember our saying, uh, the trend is bearish until it isn't, or the trend is bullish until it isn't. Everything is still bearish, so we're going to treat them as bearish. We're not going to try to front run anything, but um, it's important to be cautious. The Dow is nearing Momo. Our regime model is still in stagflation. Nothing has changed there yet, but we are seeing a shift. Uh, we, we are looking at the internals of the system and... We're seeing a shift um, in the underlying, and we might get a risk on pivot sooner than you think. We'll talk about yes. that some more in depth on this podcast. Let's yep. take a look at the calendar for next week. Next week on Monday, we've got Fed Williams speaking, nothing else. Tuesday, we've got PPI Final Demand, Empire State Manufacturing Index, and another Fed speaker. Wednesday, we've got retail sales, import and export prices, industrial production, business inventories, housing market index, EIA petroleum status report, and treasury international capital, as well as another Fed speaker. Thursday, we've got more Fed speakers, housing starts and permits, jobless claims, Philadelphia Fed manufacturing index, and the Fed balance sheet. Friday, we've got existing home sales. So another pretty eventful week coming up. All right. So um, let's go over what happened this week, though, because we did have a lot of um, a lot of market action and not too many releases. So we're going to start with the um, crude oil stocks. We're back in positive territory. Uh, this, obviously, this is a monthly chart so this number will ch shift as the month goes on but as you see the more negative monthly prints or monthly closing prints the more power there is for higher crude prices so slowly we're getting uh, back into positive territory we'll see if this sticks if it does it might be a headwind for oil going forward but again this can change rather quickly um, now we had the consumer price index the big release this week come in with a 7.7% change year over year. This is headline figures. So the key here is that we're now showing signs of the rate of change slowing, right? We're, we're at the um, lowest print since basically earlier this year, right? Um, we're, we're declining. We're off the highs decently now. We're in the sevens. Um, we were in the high, uh, high eights. Just a few, just not even a few months ago. So now we're we're slowly dropping back, and the question is going to be, can we hold the sevens area? Um, but this is a rate of change figure, and obviously this is a bit deceiving, because even if inflation goes up half of what it has been, we we will um, still have a positive figure, right? So we'll still experience inflation, just not at the degree of which we've experienced it in the last year. So again, this is a very deceptive figure because if you take a look at the CPI index on the screen, it never actually goes down. So it's yeah. almost- and, um, and that's a, a, a thing to mention with this as well is this does not mean deflation. You know, a lot of people are mistaking this like, okay, inflation has peaked, get ready for deflation. No, that's not the case. Inflation can yeah. peak, but we still can, we still won't get deflation. You know, it, it's not- it's not like one after the other inflation right. peaks and then you get deflation. You can get yeah. peak in inflation, lower inflation, but still inflation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you on that because long story short, um, the, the, it matters where we're going with the inflation numbers, right? Because if inflation 
as a whole doesn't slow down fast enough, the Fed is going to still act aggressively. And we'll get into what went on this week in markets, but you know, as, uh, uh, an inflation number of 7.7% is still extremely high. We're cheering about something that's still extremely high. Now we need to see this grow, come in aggressively because what's going to happen is if this stays and consolidates and then starts going back up again, the Fed is going to be faced with what we see, what, we, what the economy experienced in 1980s or in the early 80s, um, where inflation went rampant, pulled back, and then went even more rampant. And that's something that obviously Fed speakers, uh, especially Powell, have made it clear they do not want to experience again. But let's go to a headline CPI because there's something else that's going on here that's a little different. So remember, I said, uh, I just said here about um, headline CPI putting in its lowest print. Um, pretty much all year at this point, right? So now if we go back and we take a look at what has been going on with core, core is not at its lowest point yet. So think about this. Headline is breaking down, right? We're, we're pretty much under the eight mark now, which was prior, call it support, right? Core, on the other hand, is not under that prior support, prior, prior, uh, even just five months ago, four months ago. So if you think about it, core still has a lot more work to do here than headline, right? Because, and, and it makes sense, right? Because core inflation is, is inflation that has been entrenched in the economy beyond the price of commodities. Right. And that's something, again, that we're going to have to watch because this is showing you that in, that inflation is becoming more and more enriched, or I should say, absorbed into the economy because people have to price things out. Mm -hmm. um, so that's now, that's the sticky component that's of the inflation. Sticky component. Yeah, it's once inflation bleeds past commodities, and like you know, let's go quick example: oil, right? Let's just say oil goes up um, fifty dollars a barrel overnight, right? It'll or it'll shot, or you know, fifty dollars is too much. Let's just say oil goes up ten percent overnight, right? Or fifteen percent. We'll use fifteen percent. It's a shock. Oh my god, whatever, right? And then in the preceding couple of months, oil falls back down. There's not that much inflation being absorbed um, because of that small move, right? Because I think of over time, it'll come back down in a few months, no big deal. It's when we have this rampant inflation that stays sticky that um, price hikes start to have to happen, like price hikes at, at stores, everything happens, right? And as you understand with the inflation basket, and as we've gone over, and based on what I just said earlier, right, the inflation is almost cemented, you see the index is continuously rising. So those price hikes that we're seeing, like when, when they talk about the rate of change slowing, right, really what they're talking about is the price hikes stopping, not, price, not prices being cut, especially on, you know, items that even at the grocery store, food, right? Like, do you really think food is going to drop 10, 15 percent? Well, that, that would be deflation. That would be a true deflationary event. Right. But even in the worst deflationary, like, like let's go to 2020, right? It was short lived, but I mean, if we can go back in time. Um, here, I'll do it right now just so we can get an idea of what's going on here. So let's go to, um, let's, let's look up inflation because I do think. So let's look to consumer price index. Go back in time, right? Look at 2008. In 2008, the CPI ended up printing a year over year of negative 1.93%. Yeah. So that was. That was true deflation right there. Prices actually came down. They didn't just slow the rise that they're increasing. They actually came down. Right. And, you know, we saw high high eights, almost nines earlier, right? Now we're at seven, seven. But what I'm my point to you is even if inflation goes from seven to zero, that just means the rate of increase has slowed to zero. But the price hikes we've experienced are still here. Yep. Now there might be some there might be some changes on like variables like oil and energy and things like that. But the producers, right? If you understand the producer that like the way the producers work, they hike prices to accommodate salaries, right? Because at the end of the day, it's like they have to pay taxes, they have to they have expenses, so they hike prices to offset the increase in expenses of inflation. Okay. Well, think about that. If inflation drops, well. They would cut prices because they were they would have what they have less expenses. Do you think employees and all these things are taking price cuts? 
No way. It, yeah. This is the this is the problem with inflation, and you could see this with the CPI basket. Let's go all the way back. Look, this thing never goes down, and we have a whole thread about that this week on on contributing factors we posted. Um, you can find it on our Twitter about really what the impl- the real implications of inflation are over time and what the main factors are, primarily being money supply. And most people believe that, especially this MMT community, that you know we can just print unlimited money, raise taxes. To, to create basically a, a tightening environment. Um, but there's only so many, po- there's only to, to a certain degree that you can raise these taxes before people try to front run these taxes and you just get hyperinflation. It's, it's, you know, it's a fool's game long term. And we're starting to see that um, slowly happen in Japan as inflation starts picking up. Uh, but that will be a podcast for a, another time when it becomes more relevant. Right now, we want to, um, we're going to go back to the, to the weekly recap and we'll continue here post core uh core cpi and let's go to the jobless claims we're starting to see the year-over-year figure um accelerate towards zero so we're starting to see some um underlying change in in rate of change numbers maybe we can get positive here and start signaling that the jobs market is indeed uh starting to go into some pressure obviously we're seeing big layoffs from companies like meta um even twitter all these big companies people are getting laid off now there are there's an underlying um theory that these People are not really unemployed because they've been working two jobs, right? They, they, they've been working from home. They have, they, they've been working, you know, there's, there's some conspiracy theories out there. I, I, I'm not going to prove or disprove them, but apparently, you know, you can work from home for Meta um, while working from home for Google or another major company um, while both employers don't know that you're working at either company. I don't know if that's true or not, but I mean, it would make sense because um, based on what I've seen, these employees post on the internet of what they are actually doing during their day. It seems like they're doing a whole lot of nothing, so that would that would make sense. It's time um, to cleanse the system. Yeah, it's time to <laughs> cleanse the system. You know how you can leverage a house, you know, with, with like eight HELOCs and whatever. Uh, basically, these guys were leveraging their their careers. Yeah, That's which I mean, I don't blame them. That's if I don't blame them either. You take advantage yeah. of the opportunity. This is what free helicopter money creates. It creates a yep. fake economy with fake workers that don't do anything. Yep. Now, we had the University of Michigan uh, Michigan Consumer Expectations come in at uh, 52.7. Now, this is still above 50. We bounced off of 50 earlier um, in, or late summer, uh, went up to 60s and slowly declining again. So this is something to watch here, see where this goes. But this is definitely not bouncing um, with the overall market. Neither is consumer sentiment. We saw this as well bounce, around, bounce off that 50 level uh, earlier this or in midsummer. And now we're headed back lower with a lower print this week at 4.7. So um, again, these two data points are suggesting that, you know, at least consumer wise, the belief isn't there that we're out of the woods just yet. Now, there's a huge difference between consumer belief and what is actually going on in the markets. And this is where the regime cycle comes in. And this is very important. We go over this all the time because it gives you a graphical representation, bird's eye view of what is going on today. So let's look at the regime cycle and let's un- let- let's figure out where and what this means today. Obviously, we've been in stagflation for a very long time now. We've been talking, berating. We've been going on about why we're why the market is the way it is because of stagflation. Technically, the next stage is deflation, right? Where CPI falls and GDP falls. Well, this pati- we're in a very peculiar area in the market where we had CPI rise for so long and growth get crushed for so long that what happens is think of it like a slingshot like you pull growth so far down it's going to have a counter trend move at some point right now Mm -hmm. it almost seems based on what the market's doing we're going to talk about that in a little bit that the market's almost picking this up or it seems very likely the market's pricing this in as a as there's a going to be a growth acceleration trade with a cpi falling trade so it's almost like we 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 skipped deflation and went to expansion. But if you look at what the system's telling us, the system actually took a step backwards. It went to inflation, right? Because we've been seeing those in, um, those rising inflation probabilities within the system. We've been speaking about them during our daily reports. Um, and, we're, and, and, and it's just it's been a rising prob- a, pro- a factor within the model. The problem mm-hmm. is, is what happens when, um, what happens if we do get a CPI falling environment that the market really starts to pick up? And I mean, Again, the CPI print that we saw here, this, like I just said with core, not really falling just yet. 
almost on the border, right? And that's why the market probably hasn't picked up the full decline of inflation just yet because it's still on the fence, right? So that's why we're sitting up here um, with the inflation um, pickups in the system where the market's trying to figure out if CPI really has peaked or not. And um, in the process, it's pricing and growth rising. Well, what uh, happens... I just want to stop you there. I think... I think we might even skip inflation entirely and go to expansion just because, like you said, it's a slingshot, but the slingshot was pulled back so far right? that GDP, like um, not GDP, but growth itself, the market has been pricing in an increase in growth for months now. You know, we, we look at the underlying of our system all the time, like the, the intricate details of it. And we are able to notice that growth has been accelerating for a few months now. But since the slingshot was pulled back so far, it might completely, we might completely skip inflation just because G, we, we were in a GDP rising and CPI rising environment for a few months now. But since the slingshot was pulled back so far, we stayed in stagflation. Um, if that makes sense, I mean, I feel like I'm not explaining this right, but yeah, I, I think I think like a better if way you're to stop so far under under average, then for you to get back up to average, like you need more and more of right. rising GDP and rising CPI data to get back into the positive. So I think we right. were in like somewhat of an inflationary environment for a few months now without the system switching. And then once we get back up into the positives, so the slingshot is finally back into positive, boom, we're going to be in expansion. Yeah, and I think a good way to really tie this together is the inflation um, signal has been building under the surface, right? And it's been building slowly. But the inflation signal as a whole only has a system score of 13 or a system confidence of 13.27% as of Friday's closing. So it's such a low confidence because there's... The market can't figure out just yet, and the, we're talking because remember our system is mainly comprised of the market and major economic indicators. But the market itself can't figure out if if growth is actually going to confirm uh, a, or, or solidify a rise. And we're starting to see that probability slowly rise, which means the market's getting more and more confident. The problem is, is if CPI does peak, right? By the time we get this actual fully confident inflation trigger. Well, we'll just be into expansion at that point, right? And we'll, mm -hmm. we'll basically be be walking back the curve. And I mean, listen, after expansion, if 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 CPI um, starts falling and growth really peaks, we will literally walk back this curve. Yeah. So the curve almost stays the same if you think about it, just in reverse. And that's that's just so fitting for this year where everything feels backwards. You know, bonds right. going down with equities. You know, um, yeah, the dollar spiking during the biggest inflation we've had in decades. You know, everything right. is everything is going backwards. So it's just so fitting that we go backwards down the curve. And think about the pain there. Think about the max pain of the bondholders and the bond dip buyers. Bonds yeah. don't go up in expansion. So they're going from this situation where they're calling deflation or whatever. I, I mean, they're or people are just completely clueless thinking, okay, equities are going down, bonds should go up. So people are piling into bonds, buy bonds, buy diamonds, whatever. And those same people are probably going to be put into a position where bonds continue even further down or just chop while equities rally again. And so they're yeah. missing out on the equity rally and they're still getting dicked down on bonds. And then yeah. when they finally capitulate, and are like, okay, whatever, I'm going to buy equities, even though everything seems broken. They're going to get into equities. Boom, we're going to go further back down the curve into deflation. And that's when the bond buy comes. I mean, that's yeah. all just an opinion. It's all fugazi right now. But, but obviously, I the system see that will happening. confirm it. We'll, we'll confirm it week by week as we see it happen, you know? Yeah. So that's the best thing. Like, we can... We um we had a we had a podcast a while ago about the strategy. Remember, the strategy starts with the system, right? So we we need to understand what the system is telling us. And right now, this is seeming like the most plausible scenario with what we know at this time, which can change. But again, 
we um if we take a look at ES, what happened this week, we obviously are hedged for a move higher for a tail event to the upside, which would be Momo on ES. Um, we obviously saw this rip into the post CPI print. Now, a quick recap of what happened here. We had Powell come out, um, you know, into FOMC. Uh, initially, the market popped. Um, you can't see it here because it's a daily chart, but the market did pop and then it flushed. Uh, and then the preceding day, we flushed lower. And we went over this, I think, in last week's podcast, right? The market was the market flushed lower um, po under the Fed day range low of the prior day, but it wasn't able to collapse. Now, why? I my theory, and this is the way I think about it when I look at markets and how markets are being priced, is what are people that are participating in markets thinking? They tried to push the market lower, right? And again, we went over this in last in last week's podcast in a little bit more depth, but they they tried to push the market lower and they were not able to, closing the week here back in within the Fed day range. So what, what we did was we pushed under this range of where Powell basically went full hawk rate hike, right? Saying we're not going to, we're not going to stop until the job's done too early to talk about, um, to talk about uh, slowing, uh, excuse me, too early to talk about pausing, right? So slowing the rate, slowing is different than pausing. So it's too early to talk about pausing. And this is where the market goes. The market goes down on uh, only to bounce into Friday. So what everyone that tried to short this late after Powell's speech was negated. Everyone that thought the market was going to go to new lows, and this was basically a BMR, right? Bear market rally is was wrong at this point on Friday. And then as we progressed into the week, we started seeing that the market was edging higher within this range. And into the CPI release is where we really saw the, the green lights flip. Um, everyone that went short was basically immediately invalidated and short squeezed right up. And we saw that continue into um, this Friday's close so from last Friday to this Friday. We um, basically confirmed that everyone that got short into or below the Fed announcement is wrong. And everyone that hedged for lower prices, expecting the market to go down, which if we take a look at the tail decks quickly, right, this is long story short, um, I'm not, not going to confuse anyone. Just think about this as uh, doomsday puts, right? This goes up, people are buying doomsday puts. This was down pretty much into the, into the, into the, uh, Fed, into the Fed meeting and only really ramped post CPI, but didn't go anywhere. And we're talking down, down way off the yearly highs here. You know, we're talking yearly highs were way up at thirties or down in eights. Right. So what this is telling you is nobody really, everyone was hedged and no one needed extra hedges for the downside move. And now you get this, the situation where everyone's caught blindsided because no one can fathom the idea that growth can bounce back. No one, everyone's saying bonds or, um, you know, and then the people that are saying melt up, most of them are saying it for the wrong reasons. They're saying it because they think they're using consensus positioning, which I never really understood or really can believe, put money behind that idea that because everyone's bearish, you have to be bullish, right? Because if you really understand that concept, then, well, if everyone's bearish, then you got to be bullish. Well, then if everyone's bearish and you're bullish and everyone's bullish, then is it bearish, right? It's like a, it's a fucking mess. It doesn't make yeah, sense. It's, it's kind of like a okay. paradox. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's bullshit, right? Long story short, people were positioned for lower prices and they're wrong, right? Long story short, not everyone is bullish. Okay. And we're seeing that with the way ES is acting. And on Friday, the bond market was closed, which is probably why we didn't see, I mean, again, bonds can trade futures, whatever. We didn't see too much going on here, but more more volatility is, is 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 likely to be seen in the next week here with what goes on. Um, did bonds put in a low? And we've gone over this in depth many times. The bonds could have put a low in. It's possible, right? Um, remember CPI is peaking. Um, inflation is starting to slow. Inflation really does decelerate. Maybe the terminals slowly come off their highs. And remember, remember this with bonds. It's not the CPI. It's the terminals that matter. Because it's where the Fed's going to go and bring interest rates that's going to make the bonds um, in the future that's going to, to hurt or make or break these bonds. Obviously, terminals are off their highs, which gave a little bid to bonds on the post CPI day when terminals fell. I think it was something like almost uh, 40 basis points off the highs, right? We were in the mid, we we're in the low fives. Now we're in the high, high fours. You're right. So right. I, I know it was at 40 basis points, more like. To be accurate, it's probably more like 30, 35 basis points, right? Yeah, I so think we peaked at 520. Yeah, and now we're at 490, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so we're we're down 40 basis points, right? Um, so, excuse me, 30 basis points, for, sorry. For the so, bond trade, all in all, 
uh, the bond trade is not there. There's there's right. no TMF play, you know, buy the dip on bonds. It's it's still not here. And right. And it, while they could have bottomed, while they could have bottomed, the big problem is is can they go sideways for six months? And that's very possible. Right. So we have to and that's attention. dead capital. And that's you're dead capital. especially if you're in triple leverage TMF, you're you're gonna have some time decay on that as well. Yeah, that's that's a hundred percent um going to happen if this thing doesn't move, which is why we are so patient waiting for the triggers of the system when they happen. We don't front run the system. Um, again, we're, we're still holding shorts, by the way. Right. We're still holding shorts, but I'm not dumb enough to look at this and say, mm, I'm seeing underlying rising probability of risk on to ignore it. I say, okay. And we saw that happen early. We, I, I put a tweet up on October 14th about this. That we saw underlying probabilities rising, and what I've been do, what I was doing prior, and what I did into that tweet was I hedged aggressively for this reason. I I said mm, if we get a tail event going up to Momo, I'm gonna still hold my shorts from here to Momo. I'll draw those uh, by me holding short from here to here on what's in the RP. I'm gonna draw that down automatically. It's gonna get drawdown, obviously, right? But how can I reduce that effect and reevaluate the situation once I get there? And that's what I did. I hedged for that reason because now if we do get to Momo, I'm still short, holding short. I can clean the shorts off after I take that. I, excuse me. I can clean the hedges off, hold the shorts. And if we go to lows, that's, that's alpha, right? Right. And, so, and that's because it's still bearish trend. At the end of the day, right. system is still saying risk off. We're still in bearish trend. We stick with the position. We're not front running it. Right. Exactly. And that goes into the dollar because we saw some major updates here this week um, with what the dollar is doing, right? Uh, just in the last two days of the week, dollar went from 110 down to 106, plunging through Momo. We actually did bounce um, around this 108 level. If I, if I go to a 15 minute, we did we did do some uh, some bouncing here around this 108. I think it was here, right? Uh, 10 108 area. It was here. The market did bounce a little bit. It, it did get snagged up on the daily Momo, but eventually just closing through it, just blew through it. All right, um, and, and it's still bullish trend though. Uh, this. DDAP isn't just a like a flick of a switch. There's a lot more behind it uh, than that. It's not just if you close below Momo, it's bearish trend. So it's it's all it also depends on the rate that it blew through. It blew through quick, so it's not going to be uh, a quick trend change just like that. We're we're gonna have to spend some time under Momo before really going bearish and fully confirming that this is the end of the more than one year plus bull run in the dollar. Yeah. And I think that this pretty much brings us to um, talking about why the dollar. Okay. Listen, I'm not telling you the dollar peaked yet. Still bullish trend. So can't quote me on that. Right. But what I will tell you is the longer this goes under Momo, the, the longer this stays um, basically under 108s, 109s, the closer we get to a trend flip. And the closer we get to a trend flip, the higher the odds are that the dollar has peaked at least short term. Now, if we look at the underlying um, components, the largest one being the euro, right? We're still not bullish trend on the euro. So we have to take this with a grain of salt. This could go to maybe the euro is trying to go for Momo and rejects and shits the bet. Well, then that means dollar would bounce and pretty much go back to the highs. Uh, and this would be a huge fake out. But if you understand what happened to the euro in the last, I mean, let's just look year to date. We're down 8% on a currency, right? Pretty decent. I mean, we were down way, way more. We've been recovering. What happens if the euro goes neutral or even even bullish or just sideways or even even higher for a little bit, right? And we have a counter trend move. And this is something that we're going to tie this in quickly to. Um, I put up a tweet on Friday uh, tagging um, the DMT guy, Santiago uh, Capital, whatever his name is. I yeah, 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 yeah. Santiago yeah, yeah. Capital. Um, because pre-COVID, I did see his stuff floating around on the internet and I, and I listened to it. And, you know, it makes sense. The math does make sense. Lines up. Seems right, right? You un if you logically understand what's going on in 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 the foreign exchange space, it it makes sense. But the problem that's gonna or, or the way that trades made or broke or broken is the time, because I remember him screaming dollar milkshake theory like DXY all the way down to you know to the lows, and now we're obviously high. So he's the trades technically in the money, right? At least when I when I first saw him, it was somewhere around here. I mean, he may have been talking about it earlier. I'm not that familiar with with his work, mm -hmm. so again, don't. Don't pin me to it. But the moral here is of what's going on. The moral of the story is that you can be right, but wrong at the same time. 
And if he's right at the end, like let's just say the DXY goes to 130, 140, but it has to go down to 100 or one and one, just follow, go bearish trend, chop around, consolidate, and spend another three years doing its thing, right? Or two years doing its thing. Maybe this whole, and as we said earlier with this cycle, if we do go to expansion, it's likely at some point, right? Rates are going to peak, right? I think about it like this. Bonds, rates are going to, there's going to be a recession where the Fed's going to have to cut rates again. We all know it. We're not going to stay at 5% forever, okay? It's not going to happen. At some point, we're going to cut. Maybe we won't go to zero. Maybe we will go to zero. I don't know, but definitely we're going to go down at least 2%, right? Right. At least 2%. So when and if that happens, that's going to be a deflationary move. So the idea is that we've gone so high in rates, they will come down. Deflation is a pending event. It is going to happen. The question is, when does it does it happen in six months? or Does it take a year and a half, two years to play out, right? And deflation is the dollar's favorite um, regime outside of the stagflationary environment we've seen. So what I'm getting at here is, do we get a risk on pivot that lasts six months or maybe even a year or maybe only three months, right? But we'll see what happens when it happens. But let's just say it lasts six months, right? Throw it out there. That means six months of dollar doing jack shit before it starts reversing and doing its thing again. So the question is not, am I going to be right with this dollar, with this idea that there's going to be a global demand for dollars? It's, am I going to be right in the right time frame? For example, if the dollar goes bearish trend right now and starts falling apart, and I was a DMT believer full heartedly, right? Well, you see where the opportunity was here. It was to go long here when it went bullish trend and get out up here and reevaluate and wait. Because let's just say the DMT theory evaporates and it's wrong. I numbers line up though. Like if you, the concept makes sense, lines up, right? But remember, always put your bias behind, uh, put your logical and rational thinking in front of the bias because the bias can really cloud your judgment. So if we are, if the dollar, if the DMT, you know, the, the whole concept is proven wrong and you haven't managed the position or, or, or the strategy behind the theory, well, what ends up happening is you're holding the bag on something that had a great opportunity with a great run. Right. And you're missing out on other opportunities. Other things. Yes, right? exactly. Your, your capital is positioned in the wrong place when we could be getting a six month long expansionary risk on pivot that is yielding us, you know, 60, 70% in the span of a year. Yeah. And that's something you guys are, are haven't seen yet, but when confidence is, um, is pushed into, into positive territory, or I should say in confident territory on a risk on regime, uh, the guns are going to go blazing. Like, okay. And, and, th and I think we're going to go over this topic at another point, but it, 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 it makes, you have to understand um, a brief, uh, to sum this up, that it's not if it works, it's how it works. Because like I just said with the dollar theory, you could have called the dollar theory working from 97. I was saying the dollar is going to be a huge demand, right? And if you look at it from, from let's call it 97 and where we are today, it's 9%, right? But let's just say we go bearish trend at a little bit lower or in the mid, we'll call it 107. So we're going to go bearish trends, 10.5%. But if you did it right, you made an extra 7% by just understanding your theory, but putting, but putting rational thinking in front of it. You, you, you take your emotions out of the trade and you look at it from a bird's eye view. And that's our new saying, bird's eye, because everything gets clearer once you go bird's eye. And then you can evaluate where you need to go in and look closer and analyze the blades or analyze, you know, microscopically what needs to shift and then go back to bird's eye and, slow, and just keep going. Bird's eye, micro, bird's eye, micro. And then you can manage everything from a, from a better perspective instead of sitting there looking with the blinders on saying, oh, dollar's going to rally. All I own is, you know, UUP to the moon, right? In reality, um, as you can see, you drew down first, then you rallied. And now you're drawing down again. And if this goes bearish trend, I can't, I, odds are a trend's going to go low, prices are going to go lower because bearish trends tend to lead to lower prices, bullish trends tend to lead to higher prices, right? So if we go bearish trend, then you have to, you have just a void of drawdown you have to sit through, which makes no sense, right? If we, mm -hmm. if we can time this right, you know, DDAP has called all the major re ra dollar rallies that have, that have happened. I don't think there's been a real serious dollar rally that DDAP has not has not taken advantage of. All right. So if we're going to get one, we're going to be on the right side of it when it happens. But if it happens in deflation, again, better opportunities to be had.
than long dollars. Right, because it a, a lot more makes sense during deflation, right? Ver, versus right. stagflation, it's very, you know, it, it's it, it seems almost as if every stagflation is a little different. Uh, yeah. Granted, yeah. this one is longer than any other stagflation period we've had before. Um, but yeah, like the, there's just, there isn't the confidence behind it with deflation. You, you know, you have the system behind it. Things are kind of orderly things, right? Things work as they should, you know, bonds go up during deflation. That's why that's, that's why that's when we're in bonds. It, it proves time and time again. Yep. And before we, um, before we leave off, obviously, um, given that we are in a risk off regime, Technically, the dollar was a buy at Momo. It was a textbook buy, right? You're coming in, um, you're coming in on, on a risk on, off regime down to Momo in the dollar, um, in stagflation, um, potentially leading to deflation makes sense, right? The problem is, is we're not potentially leading to deflation. The if bird's eye view, you might think, oh yeah, it's stagflation, right? Stagflation, deflation, whatever. By the dollar, we're going to be long, long it for the for the long haul. But obviously, we saw different probabilities rising under the surface than deflation. So we had to take that with a grain of salt. We sidestepped this move because it doesn't make sense. If, if, if risk on probabilities are continuously rising. That means um, lo lower prices of dollar uh, of the DXY are also incrementally rising. So we don't want to have anything to do with this until um, we have some more solid direction given, you know, we um, we get a deflation trigger. If, if we get a deflation trigger, it makes sense to be long dollars. Even in stagflation, this, Dollar does, dollars pretty much haven't done anything in any of the prior stagflation triggers going back to 2005 until now. So this is like a one-off event. Um, again, call it um, call it a tail event, if you will, with what happened with the dollar, and that's because stagflation was so so extreme. And one in, 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 is again, remember slingshot. Go, both gold and bonds were not the trade, so people hoarded dollars, and obviously that's what we're that's what we're seeing here. Um, and we've been claiming for higher dollars for a while. Um, but again, we, the reason we never actually long the dollars is as I just explained, this is a tail event, not really seen back in our models. If it was, we would have been long the dollars. And the idea was that at the time, up until just in the last month or so, month and a half, when risk on probabilities really started making a move under the surface, the idea was we're going to get deflation at some point. And, right. and that's um, exactly, that's textbook example. Why we've. Those listeners that have been with us for a few months now, we've been warning, we do not front run the system. You yep. know, everyone was calling deflation. We were calling, we, well, we didn't call deflation, but we were warning that we are likely going to transition into deflation after this stagflation. Yep. But we never but bought we were bonds, wrong. No. And that's why we yeah. don't front run the system because now we didn't the buy system lot. looks like it's probably going to flip to risk on and likely expansion. As of right now, yes. But we're not going to front run it again because nope. there's no point. The system, when it tells us, it tells us at a good time. We don't miss the move. We don't, there's, there's no reason to. We'll have conviction yep. when the system flips and we'll be able to go balls deep like we always do. Uh, I think that's a good place to, to wrap it up. Um, if you guys like this podcast, please share, like, and subscribe. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us on our discord or at our twitter at the market radar the link to our discord and our daily reports and ddap indicator access can be found at www.market-radar.com